Good afternoon. Welcome everyone joining this special pro-life update webinar as we get folks signing in. Thank you so much for taking time. I will. I am especially appreciative for, for our two guests taking time out of their busy schedules with both representatives here. Thank you so much. And we'll, we'll get introductions started momentarily. As folks are joining on, just wanted to point out a few items. Certainly our organization, Pennsylvania Family Institute, we've engaged upon a variety of issues. And if you don't receive emails from us, I would encourage you to sign up for them. You can contact us about that. Uh, Tom Shaheen, our vice president for policy, uh, just wrote an email giving a summary of a variety of issues going about in our legislature, pro-life issues, uh, also school choice, election reform. There's a variety of things happening in Harrisburg. And so you can get uh, some insights from him as well as the United States Supreme Court, uh, the, the, the recent decision on the Fulton versus the city of Philadelphia. Uh, Michael Gear gave a, an insight. Our, our team at the Independence Law Center wrote a brief in support of that decision. And so just wanted to highlight, if you don't receive communications from us, certainly encourage you to do so. Uh, you can do it at pafamily.org and contact our organization. I know it's certainly been a very busy week in Harrisburg, and that's especially why I appreciate our, our two special guests, really two pro-life champions in our Pennsylvania House of Representatives who are taking time out of their schedules to be with us. So thank you so much. It's State Representative Kate Clunk uh, from York County and State Representative Frank Ryan from Lebanon. Thank you so much for joining. And I think I'll start just, uh, Representative Clunk, uh, I, I wanted to, to highlight uh, from Hanover, Pennsylvania, you are the uh, co-chair of the Pro-Life Caucus in the Pennsylvania House. And in particular, one of the legislations we wanted to highlight here that was passed last week in the State House is the Down Syndrome Protection Act. And uh, I wanted to highlight that legislation. And perhaps before we do, just to give some perspective, I wanted to also highlight that you are a mom and, and you have some, some uh, you know, uh, experience as a, as a mother. How does that, uh, I guess just by way of introduction, kind of help give you perspective on a variety of legislations that you do, including even the Down Syndrome Protection Act? Well, first, thanks so much for um, hosting this little seminar here over lunch today. Um, I really look forward to the questions, but it's, it's great to be a pro-life champion um, in Harrisburg for all of the unborn um, across Pennsylvania and really across the United States and the world, because I think what we're doing here in Pennsylvania helps set the stage for what other states are going to do um, across this nation. And for me, I, I am a mom, uh, now twice, two times over. Um, we have been blessed with two beautiful daughters. Uh, my daughter, Grace, she is three and a half, and little Claire, she is uh, just a little over five months old. So, you know, I came into the legislature back at one in 2014, pro-life then. Uh, but I will tell you, being a mother, going through all of those doctor's appointments from the time that you get that positive pregnancy test um, until you know today, every single step of the way has just further entrenched me in being pro-life. And our family has been pro-life for generations. Um, my grandfather, um, as Frank knows, Frank knows um, my family, but knew my, my father, they actually went to college together down at Mount St. Mary's. So my, my dad's side of the family, very um, devout Catholic, very pro-life. And my grandfather was a, a Democrat state representative from Adams County, just uh, to the west of us here, from 1970 to 72. And he did not speak on the floor that often on issues. But when he did, uh, he really spoke on pro-life issues because that was something that was very near and dear to his heart. And for me, it's carrying on that legacy of protecting the unborn, making sure that they have a voice because unfortunately in the world in which we live today, um, they oftentimes don't have that voice. So for me to be their advocate, um, it's, it's a lot of weight that goes onto those, our, you know, our shoulders. And I know Representative Ryan can you know, talk about that too when you carry these heavy, heavy issues across you know, the finish line for folks in Harrisburg, there's a lot of heavy weight that comes with it, but there's a lot of reward too because of all of the families and folks across Pennsylvania and, and honestly across the country who we hear from who are thanking us every day for what we're doing and standing up for life. Absolutely. Well, your, your reference, I'll, I'll introduce as well, Representative Ryan uh, from, from Lebanon County. Uh, I believe I, I, I can remember uh, years back, you were a, a guest at our City on the Hill Youth Leadership Conference for, for Pennsylvania Family Institute and uh, just captured the, the attention of our high schoolers there. And I've just appreciated over the years your, your leadership, your pro-life leadership in the house. And I guess by way of introductions, I know as a, as a father, as a husband, as a grandfather, 
uh, and also a retired Marine Colonel. How, how have those experiences really helped you in the the day-to-day -day interactions and role as a state representative? Well, first of all, they've been instrumental. My faith is extremely important. And I often tell people that uh, I'm so thankful that Christ saves and forgives uh, because I've, <laughs> as I go through life, and when you get to be age 70, you realize, and Kate's dad, Kate's uh, father knew this quite well uh, uh, about me, is that, you, you know, you have to learn to, to, uh, to pick yourself up, dust yourself off as you do things throughout the course of life. Uh, but when it, this, this pro-life issue has been actually transformative. And when Kate introduced the bill on the Down Syndrome Protection Act, actually that was uh, really what got me mobilized. First of all, she's done a phenomenal job and, and I was, we were so great to, uh, to live vicariously through her pregnancies and seeing Grace on the house floor was phenomenal. Um, I call her my great granddaughter that we've got on the house floor. Kate's my granddaughter in case she doesn't, she, I tell her that on a regular basis. <laughs> But I tell people that I think Christ has got a way that to have a big impact on your life. I, and when Kate did her bill, I told her about a story about a young woman by the name of Ann Sutton when I was in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And Ann was a young girl. I just moved to, to Emmitsburg from Baltimore, Maryland. So I was kind of out of my element. Uh, it doesn't take long to look at me and realize I'm kind of a geek. Uh, uh, academics were always very important to me. So I, you know, would, would, I was a bookworm. And when I first got to school, it was kind of a lonely thing. And some kids were teasing me because I was walking with Ann to school and Ann had Down syndrome. And she turned to me and, and it, it was an unbelievable impact. And I think God set this up. I know God set this up for this. She turned to me, she said, you know, if you'd rather not walk with me so they don't make fun of you, I understand. And, and I thought, you know, this is incredible. Here's a young woman. And I remember telling Kate that story. And um, it, here's, a, here's a young woman who had a massive impact in my life. And that started a lifetime of commitment to helping children with disabilities. That's why I walked across the United States in 2014. Mm -hmm. And it would also lead to the issue, uh, the loss of three children is what led to my Unborn Child Dignity Act. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, again, thank you so much. And it highlights just the humanity of the people that we're talking about, I think, with these pieces of legislation, like what you're sharing. So uh, I think to, to dive in, and, and it's great that it's almost, we're, we're family on this call, I guess, here, and both the two of you. Uh, so glad to have you both on this discussion. Uh, so I guess in looking at uh, what Representative Rye was sharing, uh, the Down Syndrome Protection Act, uh, this was not the first vote. Uh, it was something that has been, been brought up in, in past sessions. And I can remember last year, Representative Clunk, you uh, giving comment at the committee hearing in the Senate. It had passed the House and you were uh, offering your, your expertise and comments on the legislation to the Senate committee that was going to be voting on it. And behind you, directly behind you were families, the uh, individuals with Down syndrome, their, their moms and dads that were in support of this legislation. And I just vividly remember that picture. And it d just underscores the humanity of these individuals that need to be protected. So. I would welcome you to share and maybe just in brief about the legislation, uh, you know, just why, what, what fuels you to kind of be behind this effort and, and what it would do. Sure, that, that moment was very powerful and, and stays with me every single time I talk about this bill. So uh, the Down Syndrome Protection Bill, I have it again this session. Um, our former speaker, uh, Mike Terzai, was the original champion along with Senator Judy Ward when she was a House member. Um, when Senator Ward left to go to the Senate, um, I teamed up with the then speaker uh, to take on this legislation and have been the champion ever since. And for me, you know, I've met with the families. I've met with um, individuals who have Down syndrome, uh, their family members, their extended family members from all over Pennsylvania, from my district. I've heard from them all across the country, even. And, you know, for me, meeting them, they're just joys. Um, you can't help but light up. You can't help but just smile and feel so much love uh, when you're having conversations with them and their family members. Um, you know, while they have an extra chromosome, um, it, it, that's not a, a bad thing, um, in my opinion, and I think in the opinions of most people, um, that they add a little bit something extra to all of our lives. Um, so for us, the Down Syndrome Protection Bill, it's been passed numerous sessions in both the House and the Senate. Unfortunately, last session, um, you know, fortunately, it got to the governor's desk, but it was vetoed. And, you know, he's vowed to veto it again. 
But I would say, you know, every, every time we get a chance to stand up for life, we should be tapping these bills, regardless of whether or not he's going to veto it. We need to keep having that conversation because maybe we're out there, um, you know, getting through to one mom who's out there and letting her know that, you know, there are families out there, there are support systems, there is information available um, that, that we can help you, you know, through a pregnancy where you have a diagnosis of Down syndrome. And it's, it's not, you know, the end of the world. If anything, it's, it's the beginning of life and, and beginning of a wonderful journey for you, um, as we've heard from so many parents and so many individuals with Down syndrome. So what the bill actually does is um, here in Pennsylvania, you can have an abortion um, up to 24 weeks for pretty much any reason except for um, sex selection. So in Pennsylvania, you cannot abort for um, you know a, a, a girl or a boy um, and that chromosome. So we extend that to a diagnosis of Down syndrome for having that extra chromosome um, that, that Down syndrome does provide. And what the bill actually does this session opposed to last session, since that time, we've actually received a positive court case just to the West in Ohio. And that was just recently decided here this spring that, um, that our bill now is actually, uh, it, mir it mirrors the language that was upheld in Ohio. So we wanted to make sure that the, the new language that we put forward would be constitutionally sound. And so the, the bill actually mirrors the language that has been upheld in Ohio, which we think is a good thing. Um, it makes that constitutional argument that the other side always likes to say that it's not constitutional. Um, but I would argue that it is because we have a duty to protect those in the womb um, who have Down syndrome. And because those outside of the womb, if, if, if we have those outside of the womb who are seeing a society in which we allow those inside the womb um, to be aborted, it really hurts their ability to live um, and, and their ability to thrive. Um, so, you know, that bill, the bill that we have really focuses, it focuses in on that um, and, and making sure also um, that the mother who is making this decision is not gonna be penalized. Um, really the penalties go on the doctor. Um, and oftentimes what we've heard, um, and I've heard this from families, um, we've heard it in testimony um, in the House Health Committee about women who uh, doctors, it, it just, it, they, they lean you into a path once you get that diagnosis of looking down the path of a potential abortion. And what we want to do is, is have that check for the doctor that if that is the reason why a woman is having an abortion because of that Down syndrome diagnosis, that that doctor needs to talk to that woman and say, look, you know, the law just does not allow for that. Here are your options. And in Pennsylvania, we had a really great set of hearings. I have to give major kudos to Kathy Rapp and Chairman Fenkel, who was there every single step of the way in the minority listening um, on both sides of these issues. Um, I had a hearing on Down syndrome and in particularly our bill and the issues surrounding it. And we had Kirk Condrich there um, and Chloe Condrich. And a number of years ago, they were advocates to pass Chloe's law. So here in Pennsylvania, those families that receive that diagnosis of Down syndrome, they receive numerous, um, numerous pamphlets and other information about that Down syndrome diagnosis, what it means. Um, you know, health-wise, what are the other resources that are available? What are those wraparound services? What we did hear in the hearing, though, was that it could be improved upon. And look, government should always look to get better at what we do. And so I'm actually looking at teaming up. I've already had conversations with a Democrat member who does not see eye to eye on my Down syndrome bill. She's voted against it. But she also sees the value in trying to help these mothers make a better decision and make sure these women have the information that they need to show them that yes, they can move forward with a pregnancy that has that Down syndrome diagnosis. So we're looking at updating um, anything with the department related to Chloe's law to make sure that that law is working for those moms and those families. So that's um, in a nutshell what the bill does. And, and hopefully we can get it across the finish line in the Senate. Um, it looks like it's teed up for a committee vote here next week. Okay. 
Well, it's outstanding. I know you're bringing up how we can improve laws and, and even pointing out how in Pennsylvania, you know, we, we uh, don't allow uh, essentially women to say, oh, I wanted a boy instead of a girl. And I think there's some improvements needed if we stand up for people with Down syndrome, uh, that this absolutely should be needed. And you, and you brought up the hearing. And I, I think that was outstanding, uh, hearing families, the, the, the chondrites. Uh, there was uh, a mom and, a, and a, a dad that they wrote testimony pointing out how they were pressured by medical professionals, you know, genetic counselors that were encouraging them to have an abortion upon the diagnosis. And that's something that we should absolutely be opposed to. And, and uh, honestly, really the, the nexus and the reason for a lot of this legislation is to speak to those medical community members to say that Down syndrome is no reason to be pressuring anybody into having an abortion. So um, I, I think that's a great analogy. And I know you've brought up Representative Clunk oftentimes with uh, what has been reported on with Iceland and the eradicating Down syndrome and how really what we're doing is eradicating people. Um, do you mind speaking it to is. that? I know. Right, exactly. It, you know, when they, when they talk about eradicating Down syndrome, Down syndrome isn't something that you can put in a vial, right? It's not like COVID where you can, you know, get a shot and, you know, prevent it. It is a genetic disorder. It is an extra chromosome that happens in the womb when, you know, egg meets sperm, when that uh, individual is created in the womb. So y y y there's no cure for it. The only, and, and, and what they like to say is, well, we're eradicating it. When you're doing that, you're eradicating people. Um, it would just be like, well, we're, we're eradicating women. How, you know, whoa, full stop there. It's just a different, it's a different chromosome. You know, we would never allow that. Um, and we don't. So what is the difference with, with Down syndrome? You know, and, and, and you, you start to think about it. Well, what's then next? You know, with genetic, with genetic um, science right now, with science, everyone likes to talk about science these days, right? There are so many things that they can test for in the womb. They can test for sex early. They can test for all of these genetic um, diseases, all kinds of other abnormalities through ultrasounds they can find. And trust me, I know because of all of the tests that I've gone through over the past couple of years with the girls. Um, and just last year, you know, going through all those ultrasounds and tests myself. Um, it is amazing what science can do. Um, and and that's, that's the really... Um, neat thing too about where we are in a society you know when when you received a down syndrome diagnosis back in like the 50s and 60s your life expectancy was you know i don't know maybe 20 years or so now people are living into their 40s 50s 60s with down syndrome and i i think about my my mom told me a story about one of her best friends and she uh, had a sister who had Down syndrome when they were when they were little, and she didn't live really much past ten years old. But the impact that she had on that family and on my mom's best friend is truly extraordinary. And unfortunately, my mom's best friend ended up um, she had uh, she lost some children um, uh, through pregnancy, and and then she couldn't actually have one of her own, but then was able to adopt, and so. I hear from her all the time on this bill and she thanks me constantly. Thank you so much, um, you know, for standing up for life and standing up for these children because of her sister and her own son um, who she was able to adopt um, because that mother chose life. So, you know, wherever we can, we should be standing up for these individuals because they're, they're living wonderful lives within our communities. We heard from Representative Barb Lyme. She talked about her wonderful niece who, um, if you talk to the, her, the niece's employer, um, sales now are through the roof at this bakery um, because of her niece. She's a great baker, great sales, sales person, and she just, she loves her job. And these individuals who are living with Down syndrome are making huge strides. They're swimming the English Channel. They're golfing at NCAA championships. They're competing in Ironman, things that most of us on this webinar can't do at all. Look, I'm a terrible golfer. I'm a terrible swimmer. And you're never going to catch me in an Ironman competition. But these individuals are doing it. And they're inspiring us 
they're living wonderful lives and we need to be embracing them as uh, Chloe and her dad, Kurt would say, and not erasing them. And that's what countries like Iceland are doing. It is a slippery slope of eugenics and it's just not where our country and I think our state and our community should be. Well, I, I concur with you, representative of, uh, I am in the camp that I cannot compete in an Ironman or I'm a really bad golfer. And so, yes, it's amazing to see these individuals and the accomplishments they make. I wanted to get, represent Ryan, the opportunity is certainly to speak into, you know, you were on the floor and voting for this legislation and, and involved in this whole process. And you shared about some of the, the, the personal connections that you've had over the years. You know, just what, what would you say on, on this legislation and, and the need for it? Hey, you know, I've often said, first of all, I applaud uh, Kate for doing this. I spoke on it in the session two sessions ago, and I think we were a little bit more muted this time because we we were concerned about how uh, vile some of the comments were being made to other members. We were trying to prevent them from being exposed to some of the issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my own personal experience is that when we sit back and start trying to say who's who's got a disability and who doesn't, uh, there are multiple types of disabilities. And I've often said that someone that might allegedly have an extra chromosome might in reality be the fact that we're missing one. Uh, because if you look at it from a slightly different perspective, I've never met someone with Down syndrome who's been mean, who's gone on Twitter and been vile and disgusting and, and disgraceful in their conduct. You know, and I, I have family members who, who have other types of disabilities, a Marfan syndrome, uh, where a child could be extraordinarily tall and then dies at a fairly young age. I had a nephew whom I love dearly and the impact that they have on people's lives can be profound. And, and we're trying to interfere in so many different cases when we start making these. And I, I like Kate's analogy on this. It's almost like we're trying to go through a genetic selection process. And as this process continues and, and, and alleged science gets better, I'm not so sure that the results and the consequences, and I am, let me say differently, I'm positive that the results for society will be worse. When we start trying to clone people that are in the image and likeness of a human rather than all life is being created in the image and likeness of our savior, that's a problem for me. And so I, I just applaud Kate for that. I'm a proud co-sponsor of the bill. And, and I have to tell you, I think it's a great bill. Uh, I will tell some, you know, all of the, the Christians on this and all those of faith that may be on the call that might not be of the Christian faith. I would encourage you that when this bill, when Kate's bill goes uh, through the Senate and gets to the governor's desk, we should start a prayer vigil and at least and pray that, that God will, will open the heart of the governor so that he'll see that this is a good bill to sign. And if nothing else, that he will allow it to lapse into law. Uh, this is just such a good opportunity for us to, as uh, people of faith to sit back and say, you know what, it's not over. The fact that he said he's going to veto this, immaterial to me, because I've seen God work in some incredible ways that you can never can imagine. So when we say in the legislature, well, we're not gonna do it because we don't want the governor to veto it. I, I would encourage all of us in the legislature to say, Let's get it to them and let's leave it in the hands of God about what happens rather than us trying to interfere with it. Just as Kate's bill 1500 doesn't want man interfering with a child with Down syndrome, nor should we interfere with God's plan that he has about what the governor will and will not do. Well, we appreciate many on this call and, and those that support our organization and support a lot of the legislation that you you both have, have been a part of uh, in praying through it and, and being active and communicating with elected officials. And we do thank you. And that's what's needed on any of these issues. Um, before I, I dive into you, you were, uh, I'd love to, to talk about your legislation, the Unborn Child Dignity Act, um, but it gets into what you're talking about, Governor Wolf. And, and I think there's a, you know, questions and questions I think abound of, you know, why, why pursue this legislation if it's just going to be vetoed? If we can't get an, uh, you know, a majority vote to override the veto, you know, why do this? And I've had interactions, you know, especially those that want to stop the legislation. But I think there's a variety of reasons why we pursue this. But I guess I'd open it up to really both of you. Why, why pursue legislation that it looks like it's going to be vetoed by Governor Wolf? So maybe Representative Clunk, uh, feel free to start off. Sure. So, you know, for me, just because he says he's going to veto it, like Representative Ryan said, who knows, maybe he will have a change of heart. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you never know. 
um, maybe, you know, he'll hear from somebody out there in Pennsylvania and their story will change him. You know, we've all had those moments as legislators, and I'm sure the governor has as governor, where you hear that one story and it just makes you think. Um, and, and maybe there's that extra prayer that's, you know, sent out that, that changes his heart. And even if we can't do that, for all of those individuals out there who are living today with Down syndromes, the mom who's in the doctor's office right now, who's getting, you know, that Down syndrome diagnosis, she needs to know that we're standing there with her. Um, we're standing there with you in this, um, that we're walking with you, that we're going to continue to fight for your, um, your right to life, your chance to live just like every single one of us um, is doing right now. So that, that's why we do it. Um, he can veto it every single day. We'll keep fighting for it every single day. And one day we will have a governor who, who sees it our way um, and, or a Supreme Court that sees it our way. And, and we'll get there and we'll be able to get this through and protect those um, with Down syndrome once and for all. And, and Dan, if I could echo Kate's comment on this, uh, I also think that uh, in just the experiences that I've had in life, that with my background as a CPA, if we could spur a discussion on with the governor and families of anyone, any child that might have a disability, that I think there's a way for us to help create a program that will help the families with funding, the long-term care. Because I do talk to a lot of parents who've got children with disabilities who will say, what happens to my child when I die? And, and that's a legitimate concern. And I think we as a society, we have faith can help craft a solution to that. That's why I walked across the United States. So I'm convinced with Kate's creativity with the uh, PA Family uh, Institute and, and Kate's uh, brilliance and the fact that we can put some financial things together, we can find a way that even the governor may be enticed to say, you know what, maybe this is something we need to do. Uh, and I, I, I absolutely firmly believe in the power of prayer. I, I was reading a gospel reading today which said I should stop worrying about things. God's, God's got this under control. And I thought, you know, do I really believe that? And the answer is I do. So then maybe we ought to give the governor the opportunity to do what he says he's going to do. And candidly, we should be praying that he has a change of heart. Absolutely. And, and, and oh, go ahead. Uh, and, and Dan, just, just one thing, you know, to add, you know, in Pennsylvania, you know, we hear time and time again that we're not supporting these families and we are supporting these families. And I personally am, look, like I said before, I'm getting ready to work this summer um, across the island in a bipartisan way to see how we can update Chloe's law. But I'm also working and we just um, kicked it out of the uh, House Health Committee. The Senate has passed it in a bipartisan way. Um, every single step of the way, I champion the bill in the House. Senator Minch has the bill in the Senate, um, medical assistance for workers with disabilities. So those who have Down syndrome, who, you know, may be limited because of some of their health concerns with, um, you know, taking that extra job and getting that promotion um, and because of that income cap, we're working to try and fix that to make sure, you know, that those um, who have job success are able to still keep their benefits, but also take that promotion. And, and we're seeing that all across Pennsylvania. You know, those with disabilities sometimes are limited and we need to hear those stories so that we can try to make sure the government is working for them, working with them to try and make their lives um, the best that they can be. And is there work and improvement? Absolutely. You know, there's work and improvement in all of our lives, even those without you know, some of those more severe disabilities. But, you know, we're working on it. We're working on it in a bipartisan way. And, and that's what people also need to hear is that we are working on it. And we do fund, um, you know, services for those with disabilities, especially those with intellectual disabilities. Pennsylvania is probably one of the best states for families to, su to support families with intellectual disabilities. I hear it all the time. I've had some families who have specifically moved to Pennsylvania because of the services that we provide. So um, that, that's one of the things that we do hear from, you know, from the left and, and from the governor, um, but we are, we are very uh, disability friendly here in Pennsylvania and we're working to try and be better um, as I think we should on all fronts with the Down syndrome bill and some other bills that we're working on too. 
And really what you guys are sharing is the conversations that have happened, you know, even with the Down Syndrome Protection Act and how that helps further along other issues. And, and I think that's especially on this, when we talk about this in, in communities uh, about the Down Syndrome Protection Act, you know, you realize people don't know that abortion is allowed up to 24 weeks. People don't know that you can't have an abortion based on the sex of the child. Uh, they don't know about, you know, the advancements really of, of people with Down syndrome. And so it's been able to further that discussion and, and the amazement, uh, the, the stories that I've been able to hear from families of children with Down syndrome have, have just been amazing. And, and so it allows that discussion to happen and really helps to further, further along legislation like this. So I wanted to dive into uh, Representative Ryan, uh, you, you, you talked and, and sadly, it's really our, our culture now, but some of the vile uh, discussions that happen uh, and, and misinformations and uh, really attacks that happen on anything regarding abortion. And I think the number one example has really been the last few weeks with the Unborn Child Dignity Act and, and your legislation and the firestorm of misinformation. I, I, I almost haven't seen anything like it. And I wanted you to just have an opportunity to share uh, just some response. You know, there was a bipartisan vote uh, last week along with the Down Syndrome Protection Act, uh, similar uh, just a, a day later in terms of voting on that legislation. And just being able to share, you know, your heart about the issue and, uh, you know, what the legislation would do. Well, first, it's it, thank you for allowing the opportunity. And as I said this to you before, thanks for providing some defense on Twitter because uh, it, was, it was pretty brutal. Uh, the misinformation about this bill is is amazing. You know, it's funny when Snoops uh, makes a comment that says a comment that by a Montgomery County commissioner is mostly false, uh, and as liberal as Snoops is, is that's kind of a, a unique commentary. Uh, but first of all, it's voluntary is I think one of the most important issue. Well, if the mom would like to remain to the baby of her child, she can do that. Uh, there is no fee for it. There's no death certificate required. We have two members of the House of Representatives that are actually morticians and they, they have uh, interest in, in funeral homes. And they said, it's almost a standard practice in Pennsylvania that if there's a, a death of a child at the um, funeral home, goes out of their way to make special concessions for the family. So they even said on that case, when they keep bringing up the cost issue, that that's not a, a valid issue. There is no fine on the mom. So someone says, well, there's a fine in here of $50. And that's a, an issue with the medical facility. But that's a current fine that currently exists on registration. A lot of people aren't aware of this. Like on the registration of birth for our uh, seventh child, it's, it says it's a fourth living child of seven. So those other three children who died uh, in our family are, were registered. And a lot of people are not aware of that. Um, and so that, that's the Bureau of Vital Statistics that happens and that occurs. You know, it was interesting. Um, I wanted to do this bill for a couple of different reasons. One is um, I found it incredibly painful to discuss the issue after we lost our first child. Uh, and and the, the child, uh, Eddie, we were going to name him Eddie. Eddie in today's world would have survived because he was well past the 22 week period of time. And uh, he, he could have survived in today's world. I was on a hospital board of directors because of the loss of my son, uh, decided to get more active in, in medical issues and went on a hospital board of directors for 28 years. And uh, we, had a specialty in neonatal. And so I would see children that were born at, at one pound. I mean, I we would see, I didn't see the birth, but I mean, we saw them later. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and there were some interesting stories about that I could tell you about because they found that if a baby has a failure to thrive, they need to be held. They need the warmth of the hand, which is really reinforced the, the, the compassion that we need to have. But I wanted to do it because I wanted moms to know that we as men don't always know how to respond. <clears throat> you think one of these days I'd be able to get past this. <clears throat> the, and, and I'm a retired Marine, so you can imagine. Mm -hmm. But I wanted moms to know that we sometimes don't know how to provide comfort for you because the, the loss is significant for us 
but it can't begin to compare with the pain that moms are going through. And I wanted moms to know, because guys are, you know, we, we frequently do the bravado thing. Wow, well, you know, what, well, you know, I can't believe this. You know, I, I used to joke uh, around the family and say, you know, my wife would say, you know, I still haven't lost the weight since the second child. And I said, well, I didn't either. And, uh, and we would kind of joke about that kind of stuff. But because I, I typically would, when we were expecting, I would put on weight as well. And, and we, we guys, we think our wives are beautiful and we don't always say that, you know, our culture doesn't always do that. So when there's a loss of a child, when I saw what, what the hospital, I, I make a big issue about the difference between medical care and healthcare. The, the person who led the assault against the bill directly and me indirectly, uh, it was a doctor, and and I felt very. I, I said I put out a press release. I said I ask you to pray for her because she understands medicine, but she doesn't understand healthcare. She doesn't understand what happens for those couples that are facing infertility, and and I've seen that. I mean, I've seen those issues. Um, I've seen what happens with that case and the pain that happens on the house floor. Some of the people who were attacking my bill because they misunderstood it. I could see the pain. I, I shared Dan the story with the, the text message from one of the members. And rather than being angry at the person, I, you know, I reached down and I said, I'm really sorry. I could see the pain in your eyes. If she really knew what this bill did, it would actually be reinforcing the comfort that we want to provide for her. I, I can't tell you the number of people who, one, one of the members was going to speak on the bill and she said after, she said, I don't think I can. I see what you're being attacked on and it's so painful what happened to me and to lose a child at 24 weeks where I wasn't allowed to keep the baby's remains. I don't know if I could take this attack that you're getting after experiencing the loss I did. And I wanted people to see that and be able to express it. One of the people who was recording me, I was describing, he was doing an interview and he was describing it. And right in the middle of the interview, he had to stop the interview, he started crying. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, he and his wife have lost five children and they've never had a successful pregnancy. And he said, to this day, we can't explain that to any of our friends. They don't want to hear it. And it's not that they don't want to hear it because they don't have empathy. It's because our culture is horrible. We're horrible about help, helping people mourn when they've gone through the loss of a pregnancy. And it's almost like we don't want to acknowledge the fact that a mom could be experiencing such phenomenal trauma. So I wanted moms to know that we love you. We're going to support you. And we just need to know how we can help you mourn and get through this as well. We want to be there with you as your spouse, as your partner. Well, I know it, it becomes an emotional issue dealing with these, these topics. And first and foremost, I do just want to say thank you for your courage and sharing your personal story, how you've, you've really had to share that more times than, than you should, frankly, uh, over uh, this issue. And you know, I'll, I'll share myself. There was several reporters that contacted Pennsylvania Family Institute at the time of this, this vote. And all three that I spoke with brought up to me how in their family, they had a, a miscarriage and they had to fight. One said, had to fight tooth and nail to be able to obtain the remains of their, their deceased child so that they could grieve uh, in the way that they chose. And, and it just underscores the need when we can get past, frankly, the vile and, and what you say in the culture and how we're so bad at trying to help people grieve. Uh, and also just with the anything that remotely touches abortion, it becomes such a heated and vile discussion. But yet if we can push that aside and look at the facts and truth about this legislation. I mean, there are families that this would help, that there are families that have had to go through what you have gone through, Representative Ryan. And, and so trying to uh, show compassion. I know you've repeated that often of trying to give compassion to people. This is a compassionate bill. And I, when people read it and understand the bill, it's absolutely trying to share that, that compassion. So I don't know if there's anything more on that. Like really, that's what I've seen as the motivation, being a, a compassionate bill that's really been skewed so much by those that want to stop this, spreading that misinformation. Um, so I don't know if you want to speak more just again, like sharing that compassion with, with families, what you've heard from families uh, that may have had similar situations to you. 
there's there have been unbelievable number of very positive comments I've had for me. I've had uh, one person came up to me. My wife was standing next to me. I was at the at a dinner, and she said, uh, "She said we're going to give you uh, an award as husband of the year." When she heard my comment about the the uh, you know the compassion. <clears throat> And my wife turned to her and she said, not so fast. <laughs> said, I'm pulling it back. And she started going to litany of the things that I've screwed up. And like, he forgot to do this. He didn't take the guard. And, and so the, everybody started to laugh. So um, what, what she said, though, that I thought was really interesting, she said, is that, that there was a, an upside and a downside to this. And I, and I didn't, I truly didn't appreciate the downside. When people saw the attack on me, which, you know, as Kate, uh, Kate kind of mentored me in my first term, even though I'm substantially older than Kate, as you can tell, uh, my granddaughter, Kate, um, we, uh, she was in the legislature before I was, and you, you very quickly get a fairly thick skin. But I didn't realize that when people were watching the attacks that were happening to me, that that's causing some people to bury their pain even deeper that they don't feel that they can bring it up because they saw the level and the type of attack. And so if there's anything that I wanna do about this, regardless of whatever the governor will do, and I hope he softens his heart on this bill, which I believe is compassionate, that anyone who's seen this attack has realized they're attacking me as a politician. They're not attacking you as someone who's lost a child. And please don't take it that way. Um, you know, I, I've got broad shoulders and I can handle the attack, but for the moms out there that have lost a child, to the dads that have lost a child, please don't take it that way. Uh, we, we do suffer with you, we mourn with you. We want you to be able to mourn in a way that is consistent with the way you feel you need to mourn to help heal during a very painful period of time in your life. And if there's any one thing that comes out of this, I hope that's it. Thank you. And I guess, uh, you know, Representative Clunk and being on the floor as well during this legislative process, you know, just what was your observations? and and the floor discussion and, and just the discussions with your colleagues on this legislation. Sure. So, so for me, you know, this is, a, this is about helping moms and as, you know, a mother um, who, who knows women um, in my family, in my extended friend group, um, constituents who've reached out, who have gone through this, I just want to say thank you to Representative Ryan. Thank you for standing up for these mothers who need who need that closure, who need that option um, that they may not have had in previous pregnancies, but now, you know, with this bill, if the governor will sign it, they will have that option. And look, I've, I've heard the stories from friends, from family members. I think about my cousin, Natalie, who's not with us. She would have been um, about a year younger than me. Um, and my aunt thanks God every single day that she was able to get her remains because she was able to have that closure. She was able to bury her. She is able to drive right up the road and visit her grave and still grieve today, you know, 30 some years later. But there are women who don't have that ability right now in Pennsylvania. You know, Eddie didn't get that chance like my cousin Natalie did to have that burial. He, he didn't. And for all of the Eddies and all of the other babies and, and all of those other moms and dads who have gone through that, that's what that bill's for, for every single one that comes next, to make sure that they have that right, to have those remains to their child, to that human being. Um, you know, it, we've, heard, we've heard a lot of misinformation about this bill. Um, you know, we've heard folks, you know, who are pro-choice. That's what this bill is. It's a pro-choice bill where the mom can have that choice on what they want to do with their child and their remains, whether that's a burial, whether that's cremation, whether that's, you know, you know donating that child to science. Um, you know, that's always an option too, to, to see, you know, what could be learned from that child's life and, and what went wrong in the, root, the womb to maybe save another baby in the future. You know, there, there's, there's so many good things that I think come from this bill and, and in this country right now, you know, we hear about mental health issues, right? And, and, and people needing that closure sometimes when they're going through grief. Um, you know, we've all grieved in some way for losing somebody in our families. Um, and that's just because it's, 
you know, a baby in the womb who might not have been born, might not have been, you know, in your arms, um, it doesn't mean that we discount that life and we don't discount that mother, that father, that family member, that brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousin who needs to go through that grieving process. So this bill gives that family that option. And for me, I can't thank you, Frank, enough for this. Um, you know, from a from a personal stand, standpoint, from you know our family and, and things that have gone on in our extended family and friend group. Thank you, um, thank you for this. Because with your bill, you know, some of the things that happen to people who we know, and to you and your wife, won't happen again. So thanks. Kate, thank you so much. And Dan, if I could just make one additional comment. You're in the military. We have a, a really important adage that we'll never leave a soldier or a Marine, sailor, or airman on the field to battle. Because we know how important it is for the family to have the remains back so they can have a proper burial. Uh, we have the, uh, at Arlington Cemetery, we have a tomb of the unknown soldier because our nation recognizes how important it is to give someone a proper burial. Why in God's name would anyone deny that to a mom who's lost a child? I, I can't, I can't fathom it. I can't. It, it, it's a great point. And, and I think if we can truly get to the realities of really trying to help people, this should be a no brainer. And, and so I, I, I cannot thank both of you enough for the continued leadership on both of these issues. And, you know, amidst all the misinformation, amidst all the hate mail and the vile things that are said, I, I just, I, I speak for many in saying thank you to, to both of you. And it does lead, I, I guess the question can be, what can people do? Uh, so I know both pieces of legislation passed the House on a bipartisan majority vote. And so both are now in the, in the state Senate. So certainly being in touch with their state Senator is something we absolutely encourage to try to support both of these pieces of legislation. What else would you say to folks and just how we can help both you individually, but also the legislation, just how, what, what can people do to help? So what, what I would say is one, contact your Senator, two, contact the governor. Say your prayers, um, include us in your prayers. Um, I will never turn down a prayer. Um, it is probably the most humbling um, part of this job is when people say that they're praying for you or an issue that you're advocating for. Um, you can feel it. Um, you know you're on the right side and you, you have that backup. Um, it's just like when I was in that committee meeting and I had all of those families behind me, um, when I was testifying on that Down syndrome bill, I could feel their presence and support behind me. Um, and, and that's what we need. Uh, we need you to stand with us, to stand behind us, to have our back. Um, but also talk to your friends, educate your friends and your family members on these issues, have that conversation with them because what they're hearing in the press, what they're hearing from the other side, are just, they're, they're false, they're false lies. And if you have a conversation with people, um, you know, I feel like I've been able to get through to so many of my friends um, who didn't understand, you know, abortion in Pennsylvania and what the law actually was and that we could abort up to 24 weeks and what that means. That means it's six months of pregnancy. I remember, you know, just a year ago where I was at six months, you know, you're showing, you can see, um, you know, all of the baby's features. Um, you can hear the baby's heartbeat, all of those things that people just don't understand. So having those conversations with your friends, educating them on these issues, because the more we do that, um, it, it's better because they trust you, right? You know, Frank goes out and talks to his, his buddies um, and I go out and talk to my girlfriends on these issues. They're going to trust us. Um, and you can talk about how you were on a webinar where you learned from the makers of the bill, what these bills actually do, set that record straight. And wherever you see the lies on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, it, set the record straight because we need to start doing that to help fight against the misinformation because the other side, they're fast and furious with it. They don't read the bills, they're quick draw um, to, to shoot us down because they don't have the facts. And we need to come with the facts, with the truth. And, and that's what I ask 
of, of all of those who support us is to get out there with the facts and the truth. Keep praying for us, reach out to your legislators, and, and we're going to keep fighting and we're going to have your back. Just we ask that you have ours too. If I could echo uh, the comment that Kate made about prayers, I mean, that's extremely important. But I'd also encourage you on the Unborn Child Dignity Act, uh, there was a reluctance based upon some of the attacks from two years ago to move it out of committee. But if you would contact the Senate respectfully and just say, please, this, this bill is different than you think it is, could you please do it? And I'm going to ask something very painful, if you don't mind. Um, if there are any moms where this bill touches your heart and you would be willing to pull a Band-Aid off in public and allow it a hearing uh, to see, have people see you as someone who has experienced that where this bill could have helped you, uh, it would mean a great deal. I was reluctant to do that two years ago and I think I made a mistake. I'm, well, I don't think I did, I, I know I did. I didn't want to put anybody through that type of pain but I, I've been stunned by the number of women who've come up to me, I, and I mean stunned, who, who started crying and saying that, that I, I often wondered, one of the members of the House of Representatives said, she's often wondered where her baby is, that I don't know. I, I can't go and do it. So if anyone is willing to do that, I would appreciate it. I'm gonna ask you something strange as well. We have a bill, it's called Sean's Law. Uh, our good friend, uh, Don Kiefer, is the prime sponsor of it. And, uh, and it's a bill where a young girl was encouraged to commit suicide in a, in a, on social media. And when I saw the type of discourse that happened on social media with the Unborn Child Dignity Act and the Down Syndrome Act as well, um, we, we have to encourage civil discourse. We, uh, one of the things that I've, I've decided to do, I'm going to try to encourage Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, and others that you have to use your real name. Uh, this idea that you can hide behind a fake profile and something is encouraging people to engage in behavior that's just not healthy. This is not healthy for our, it's not. It, in my, no matter how you look at this, this is not healthy for our culture. So I would encourage you, this is a, this is a, a battle for the soul these two bills and the heartbeat bill are the battle for the heart and soul of our nation. It's the heart and soul of our globe. In Europe, you can't do on social media what we do in the United States. And it's not attempting to, to infringe upon anybody's free speech at all. It's basically saying if you want free speech, you have to own the words you've said. And, and it's, I think it's really important that we sit back and recognize that this kind of conduct, I've saved some of the emails that I've gotten uh, at the request of our speaker. He made a comment, he said, he put these aside and he wants one day write a book about the type of commentary that people will do so that you can get a better perspective. Because what it does is unfortunately, uh, when you start seeing this kind of conduct, it, encourage, it encourages really good people to say, you know what, I don't need to do this in, in public life let me go back into the private sector. And when that happens, we're all going to lose. There's certainly a lot of actions that people can take. And, and I think one thing just to encourage both of you is, you know, certainly at the Pennsylvania Family Institute, we have your back. Uh, and there's a lot of people around the state that, that do as well. And, and so we do thank you for all the things that you do behind the scenes, uh, what you're doing in this uh, legislative effort and the many issues. I know it's a, it's a busy time, certainly with many the different topics and, and what you guys are engaged upon. But we do thank you so much for that. And I guess to close, um, uh, you know, our organization, certainly you can point uh, pafamily.org for more information about uh, these particular pieces of legislation and others. And we do appreciate the many that do take action that contact your elected officials that pray for us. And I guess just in close uh, for, for uh, both of you uh, and, and tremendous, again, uh, I'm thankful for you both as pro-life champions in our, in our house. Um, we, we talk with our students at our City on the Hill Youth Leadership Conference that's coming up at the end of July about where God will lead you, wherever that might be. And I'm thankful that God's led you to both uh, you know, serve in, in this capacity and what you guys are doing there. And for the many of our supporters that do support what you guys are doing, that, that back you 100%, that are praying for you, 
I guess just give an opportunity to you to, to speak to them. Uh, you know, we'll be co connecting with them about this webinar. Many are on now and, and many will watch later on uh, of just what you'd like to say uh, to those that are supportive of these efforts. Uh, so maybe Representative Clunk, feel free to, uh, to open. Thank you. We need you. <laughs> we need your friends. Um, keep, keep fighting the good fight for us uh, among your friend groups and your churches in your social circles, in your families, um, keep praying for us. And at the end of the day, just know that Representative Frank Bryan and I and the majority of both the House and the Senate in Pennsylvania also stand with you. And at the end of the day, um, there's more of us um, on, I think, the right side of these issues. And someday, whether that's tomorrow, next week, a month, a year, number of years down the road, We'll get there. We just have to keep fighting for it. Um, and I know I'm in the fight and you guys are in the fight and we just, we, we thank you for standing with us every single step of the way and we'll get there and we'll get there together. And, and I want to just again, comment on that as well. I'm so thankful for Caden and she's brought up Kathy Rapp, our chairwoman. It's just been a, a great champion of pro-life issues. Our speaker has as well. We've got a tremendous group of people who are very pro-life a lot on the Democrat side, a lot more than you might think uh, we do, uh, that I think we are so incredibly proud of. Uh, I would just ask if you want mine, it's kind of a personal favor, just ask that the Holy Spirit guide uh, Kate, myself, and others in this, so we know what to say, when to say it, and so that uh, he will put the words in our mouths that we need to say at the right time, and that we will do so with compassion and understanding, regardless of the comments that might be made towards us. Absolutely. Well, I, I thank you so much for, for taking time out of your day to connect with us. Uh, for everyone here, we, we will certainly keep you both in our prayers, uh, continue to pray for these efforts, continue to, to recruit others as, as we've talked here, and uh, continue to advance these important pieces of legislation. So, uh, so representatives, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, again, thank everyone for being a part of this discussion. Uh, we'll continue, continue to support you all the way. So. Thank you so God much. Bless. Thank you. Love you guys.